Hello everyone, welcome to commissioningandstartup.com. My name is Paul Turner and I help people and projects succeed at commissioning. So thanks for joining our discussion today on uh, our live webinar discussion on commissioning contracts. This is a very helpful discussion. I'm sure that you'll find it uh, very informative. The contracts, of course, are the most important documents on the project and the commissioning team needs to pay particular attention to all the contract documents, particularly the technical specifications. So we'll go through each parts of the, the contract and ensure that uh, the commissioning team is focusing on the important parts of the contract. So we're broadcasting on three channels on LinkedIn, YouTube and Facebook, and we'll be taking questions on all three of those platforms. So as I'm going through the information, I've got a bit of a presentation here. Please ask your questions in the chat box and we'll be gathering them up and we'll be able to answer them at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. <clears throat> so the agenda for today is I'll go through a little bit of my commissioning experience. The majority of the discussion will focus on commissioning contracts. I'll tell you a little bit more about how you can learn more about commissioning, and then we'll have a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. So my name is Paul Turner. I have over 20 years of experience working with complex systems as a professional electrical engineer and a registered project management professional. Through those years of experience, I've gained some valuable commissioning and startup experience, and I'm happy to share that knowledge with you. I live in Canada. I have an awesome family, and we love to adventure and explore the outdoors. Some of the projects that I've worked on, I've worked in the aerospace industry, uh, building satellites and rockets for the Canadian Space Agency. This is a picture of me earlier in my career uh, looking through the Cassiope satellite. The picture there is a picture of SISAT. It was one of the earlier uh, satellite projects that I worked on. I've also worked in the power generation industry, uh, working on a 200 megawatt hydroelectric generating station in northern Manitoba. Power transmission, I was the commissioning manager for a 2300 megawatt HVDC transmission link spanning 1400 kilometers from the north to south of Manitoba. And currently I am the commissioning manager for a wastewater treatment plant where we were upgrading and expanding the existing facilities. So the topic for discussion today is commissioning contracts. And there's a few aspects we're gonna look at with regards to commissioning contracts. The contracts, of course, are the most important documents on the project. They define how the project is structured, um, how people are to interact with each other, everybody's roles and responsibilities. The contracts essentially define the rules of the game and how the project will proceed. There's various aspects of the contracts to consider and the overall project structure. Um, some of them are project delivery method, the contract delivery method, the procurement strategy, as well as some of the parts of the contract, and then how do the contracts impact commissioning during commissioning activities, and we'll go through each of these points in the next few slides. So with regards to uh, the structure of the contracts on the project, there's a few different project delivery methods that can be used. Uh, a common delivery method is DBB, Design Bid Build. So this is a, a common contracting strategy where the engineering is completed and then that engineering package is put out to tender to award the construction contract. So largely a lot of the design effort is done up front so that the contractor knows what they're bidding on. It does involve two different entities to complete the work, the designer and then the constructor. The challenge with this method is that those can somewhat be separated in that the design is completed without having a lot of the construction input or constructability reviews, which leads to the next type of project delivery method, design build. This is where one group is responsible for both the design and the construction. So the construction the contractor would have an in-house engineering group that would perform a lot of the design. So this contract is awarded upfront um, in advance of completion of all the de design drawings and uh, awarded strictly based on a technical specification of what the uh, project is to achieve. 
Now, in this case, you get um, somewhat more synergy between the construction group and the design group in that they're the same group. So any input in construction early in the design phase can be taken advantage of to increase um, constructability in the field or allow optimized inputs to the design to allow easier construction methods uh, later in the project. Another method is CMAR, the Construction Management at Risk. It's kind of in between the two that we just discussed, Design Bid Build and Design Build, where first a contract is awarded for the design of the project, but when the design is complete, say at about 20-30%, is when the contractor is brought in as well. And that construction contract is awarded uh, partway through the design to allow the contractor to have input to the design to potentially propose uh, better ways of building the project, more constructible designs to get that synergy between the two groups. And then uh, a fourth method here is a, a triple P or a P3 public-private partnership where the contractor takes on even more of their responsibility, including financing of the project, where it's an agreement between um, a government or private firm and creates a, a partnership in that there's an agreement that the, the group that's hired will finance the project, design it, build it, and potentially operate it as well. So those are some of the common project delivery methods that exist. <clears throat> Within that, there's different types of contract delivery methods. So the first one listed here is lump sum or fixed price. So the scope of the work is defined up front and the contractor determines the cost to do the work. The owner awards that uh, defined scope of work for a fixed price amount that will be paid to the contractor. So in this case, the contractor bears all the risk. If the level of effort takes more, then it's a fixed price. That's what the owner pays. If the level of effort takes less, then the contractor is uh, allowed to benefit from that less work required for the, that particular scope of work. Um, but it's security to the owner in that they know that the price they're going to pay up front. The other method listed here is cost plus. This uh, puts the risk on the owner in that whatever the actual costs are, the contractor will submit that and they'll be paid that plus a percentage fee. So if the work is estimated to take 10 hours and then it ends up taking 20 hours, the risk is with the owner to pay that 20 hours of work and the contractor doesn't have any risk. This would be more so for if the upfront scope is not known at the time that the work needs to take place, that this type of structure would be used. Time and material is very similar to cost plus in that uh, the contractor performs the work, submits their actual time, their actual material, plus uh, an agreed percentage on top of that. Uh, there could be in time and material case, uh, an agreed to target price in advance of the work taking place. But again, the owner would retain the risk that if it takes double the amount of time, then that is paid to the contractor. Unit price would be a structure that's more related to linear infrastructure. So if you're building a transmission line or building a, a pipeline, you may have a unit price that's so much per kilometer. So if you end up building 10 kilometers of transmission line, then that unit price is paid per kilometer for those 10 kilometers to the contractor. It's very flexible that towards the end of the project, if you need an additional kilometer of transmission line and you have to do 11 kilometers of, of uh, transmission line, no problem. You just pay the unit price for that additional work and the contractor is reimbursed. GMP is a guaranteed maximum price. So in advance of the work, a target price is determined uh, that the contractor must complete the scope of work for. Now the risk is somewhat shared here that if the work exceeds the guaranteed maximum price, the contractor's profit margin then starts to decrease up to a certain point. So the contractor is still motivated to complete the work to that guaranteed maximum price in order to achieve their maximum profit. If they exceed that, profit amounts start to decrease. So that can be a, a helpful contract delivery method as well. In regards to those two types of strategies, you also want to consider your procurement strategy. The procurement strategy will really determine the success of the project. Often I see uh, 
projects awarded strictly on lowest price. And your procurement strategy really needs to consider all aspects of the group's ability to complete the work. So not only price, but their uh, project team structure, their construction plan, uh, material management plan, quality management plan, uh, schedule management plan, all of those aspects. And through their submission of their proposal to do the work, you want to evaluate each of these components to ensure that you're selecting the right guy to do the job, not just based on price, but based on price and their ability to successfully complete the job. So there's a few contract structures um, or procurement processes that I've, I've gone through. Some of them, uh, two of them are CCDC or FIDIC. And these are templated structures that you can use for your contracts as a, as a guide, as a starting point to then take and modify the templates to be specific to your project, to include the terms and conditions that are specific to your project. And I strongly encourage you to use these types of contract structures when preparing your contract, since the contractors will be familiar with these contract structures, um, owners will be familiar with them, everybody will kind of generally know how the project is to proceed with regards to the structure of the contract, and it does form a proper procurement strategy to build up something like a, a FIDIC contract. In cases where groups have wanted to use, say, a past contract, take something off the shelf that they maybe used a few years ago and modify it for the next project, it really doesn't include all the aspects of a proper um, procurement strategy such as FIDIC, where you can follow the structure and build up a proper contract in the end to uh, facilitate the work to optimize the project. So when you're going through your procure procurement strategy, there's a few things that are evaluated uh, in the contractor's submission that form the contract, such as the contractor's team structure. Do they have the right people that can complete the job? Do they have the, the right experience, the right roles that are filled on the project? Contractors' construction management processes, such as how are they managing quality or how are they managing schedule? Everybody will say that they have a schedule and they manage to a schedule, but what are their actual internal processes in how they manage schedule? Is schedule actually used on a day-to-day -day basis to manage the work, or is it something that they just submit monthly because the contract says they have to? The contractor's risk management processes, so when risks exist on a project, how is the contractor assessing those and evaluating those on a day-to-day -day basis and managing the risks of the project uh, to ensure the interests of everybody are protected? The contractor's construction plan. So how are, they, how are they sequencing the work? How are they managing material deliveries? How are they managing uh, completion of the work and handover to the commissioning team? And of course, the contractor's commissioning plan. So what is the commissioning sequence? Um, what portion of commissioning are they responsible for? Do they have qualified individuals to complete the commissioning tasks? And how do they intend to do uh, testing at the end of the project to confirm that the work that they've installed has in fact met the contract requirements? <clears throat> So a few parts of the contracts that we'll, that we'll go over, and uh, just a note, these pieces that I'm going over are related to a FIDIC contract structure. We'll go through each one of them and uh, how they relate to the project and how they relate to commissioning. So the first one is the Articles of Agreement. Once a contractor is selected, once a, a contract is going to be awarded, the Articles of Agreement are essentially that last final set of documents that, where everything's agreed to, the price is agreed to, the schedule is agreed to, all the contract terms are agreed to, and it's the final signing page saying that the contract now becomes binding on all parties. Second part, general conditions. So these would be the general terms and conditions of the contract. They're not necessarily specific to the project, but they're the general conditions, um, terms and conditions that the owner wants to ensure are encapsulated on the project. Uh, the next section, general and local conditions, this would be an expansion of the general conditions, but more specific to the project where terms and conditions that apply maybe to some of the specific site conditions or uh, work locations are included in the contract in this section for general and local conditions. 
the next section, uh, technical requirements. So this is probably the portion of the contract that the commissioning team is most interested in. The technical specification essentially defines what the project is to do, the performance parameters that the project is to achieve. Therefore, this is the section of the contract that the commissioning team is going to use as their baseline for verification. This is what they need to verify and show that the project meets all of these technical requirements to confirm sign off at the end of commissioning that the project has in fact met all the technical requirements on the project. Payment milestones and contract price. So this is an important one for everybody. The commissioning team will certainly want to be aware of this portion of the contract because the commissioning team may be being asked to confirm that portions of the work are complete or some of the testing has in fact passed the technical specification in order to achieve some of these payment milestones. So this section will define how is the contractor going to be paid um, as the project progresses, what milestones do they need to achieve in order to reach those payment milestones, and of course the final contract price. Contractor's schedule is submitted in their proposal as well. Uh, the initial schedule from the contractor will form uh, a portion of part of the contract here, of course, and is essentially the baseline schedule that is agreed to at the beginning of the project. The baseline schedule is always referenced throughout the project because as, as the work is going to change, in, invariably it will need to change, when any changes occur, if there's a de delay or additional tasks that need to be incorporated, you'd like to see that those tasks are being incorporated in order that the baseline schedule can still be achieved. If there's, a, say, a two-week delay, then you'd like to see how is that going to be recovered in order that the baseline schedule can still be met. So the, the baseline schedule is an important part up front here to confirm what is agreed to at the beginning and how some of the milestones are going to take place throughout the project in order to achieve the in-service date. Contractors organization and team. Um, so there's several roles that are required on the, on the construction team. Uh, construction manager, quality manager, uh, all of the uh, superintendents. So what is the structure of the contractor's team? And what are the specific skill sets of the individuals that are going to be filling those roles? Do they have the necessary skill sets to fulfill those roles? And can the contractor put forth a, uh, an expert team that can manage the construction on time and on budget? Contractors plans for managing the work. And unfortunately, this can sometimes get overlooked, but it's an important part of the overall uh, proposal and contract for the project is how is the work actually going to be managed on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the contractor's internal processes to actually complete the work? Is it as simple as throwing a bunch of drawings out in the field and say, go build this? Or is there an actual proper work management issuance and tracking process that aligns with a quality management system in order to ensure that the work is completed per contract and that it's meeting the quality requirements. This is an important one and needs to be evaluated up front to ensure that the right groups are involved to complete the work. The contractor's construction plan. So this provides the details of how the contractor is going to complete their construction activities. So what is the sequence of the work? How are they managing deliveries on site? How is the work being overseen? And generally, how does the construction plan align with the commissioning plan, which is the next section here? The commissioning plan, when submitted this early in the project, will be pretty high level, but still at least needs to provide the detail on the sequence of activities and the general schedule of activities to demonstrate that the plan is at least understood and can be further developed as the work proceeds. This is this is an important one too, of course, for the commissioning team. They're going to want to uh, review this section of the contract and ensure that the proper individuals are involved and that the commissioning timelines can be met. The contractor's quality plan as well is an important part for the commissioning team because if the construction that precedes commissioning isn't being installed correctly or isn't meeting the, con uh, the proper quality requirements of the contract, 
it's going to be very difficult for commissioning to meet their objectives knowing that the uh, systems that are being received from the construction group aren't necessarily at the proper quality levels in order for the project to function correctly. So the contractor's quality plan is definitely an important part of the contract here as well. On large projects or particularly in remote projects, sometimes uh, the labor force involved in construction can be quite challenging to recruit, recruit the large number of people to remote locations that are required to build some of these large projects. So the contractor's workforce and labor strategy plan are important to understand what is the workforce that's involved and how is the contractor going to engage the labor required, particularly remotely, to have the workforce on site to complete the work. Contractors subcontractor and supplier list. There will, will be, of course, many subcontractors that are involved in the project and you want to understand and see who those individuals are, be them local groups or being brought in from uh, further locations. Who are the groups that are involved to complete each aspect of the work? In some cases, um, once the project goes into service during the warranty phase, there may be performance guarantees that are required as part of the contract. So what performance guarantees are is the project is monitored for a period of time to confirm that it achieves certain metrics that are measured during the warranty period. An example could be minimum uh, guaranteed losses of a rotating machine, guaranteed availability, uh, things such as that that are defined that measured over a period of time would determine exactly how the, how the project how the system is performing per the technical specification. During that period, if those technical metrics are achieved, then the contractor may achieve their final payout. But if only say a portion of the guaranteed losses are achieved, then maybe they only receive a portion of that final payout based on the contract terms that are defined in the performance guarantees section of the contract. Performance securities would be pretty standard in many contracts. These would be the, the bonds or a letter of credits that would exist that are established and uh, a portion of funds set aside that can be used should the contractor uh, default on any portions of the job. The owner can call on these particular performance guarantees to have security that the work can, be, can still be completed. And then variation procedures, of course, when the contract is written at the at the beginning of the project, there's likely going to be aspects that are still going to need to change during the contract, be it additional work or design changes or things like that. So the variation procedures section of the contract defines that change management process on how are these changes incorporated into the work for extra work and determining cost and schedule impacts and how the contractor is reimbursed for those portions of uh, changes that take place during the contract. Insurance requirements are uh, pretty typical defined up front where it's understood on the level of insurance required by the owner, the level of insurance required by the contractor and any other groups that are involved in the project so that everyone understands what insurance is to be uh, obtained by each party on the project um, so that everybody's aware of who's covered for what. And then the last section here, dispute resolution procedures. Invariably, someone's gonna have a different opinion on the contract and there may be a dispute that uh, needs to be resolved. So dispute resolution procedures will define how that process works uh, in the contract for levels of escalation to senior management, to mediators, to arbitrators, to final claims closeout, and how do those disputes get resolved in a timely manner so that the work can still be completed on the project. So when it comes to commissioning, um, the commissioning team does need to pay very particular attention to the contracts, particularly the technical specification. The commissioning team will certainly want to be aware of all aspects of the contract uh, so that the activities that they're conducting or taking place as part of commissioning are fitting into the overall contract and, and project structure. 
particularly the, the technical specification. That will be the document probably that you'll have printed out on your desk and you'll be ac accessing on an hourly basis um, to confirm what's in the technical specification and that the equipment being tested is in fact meeting the technical requirements that are defined in that technical specification. So that's a bit of an overview of contracts and how they relate to commissioning. I hope you found it helpful. I also want to point out another helpful resource. If you haven't already, please check out our three-day mini course. The course is free and flexible and you can take it online anytime and it gives you everything you need to know to understand the commissioning and startup process. You can get started with this free course at commissioningandstartup.com. I also want to point out that we do have fully accredited mechanical and electrical commissioning courses. These courses give you the fundamental details of everything you need to know about commissioning a mechanical or electrical uh, system. Uh, please check out our courses. You can check them out at commissioningandstartup.com. With our recent accreditation, we are also able to provide CEUs and PDHs that can apply towards your professional designations. Also, please check out our YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to YouTube and search for Commissioning and Startup, and we'll come up there as well. Or you can go to youtube.com slash C slash Commissioning and Startup. We will be doing some new and interesting things with our YouTube channel coming up here shortly, so please be sure to check that out and make sure that you subscribe. And we can now move on to our question and answer portion of the webinar. So we've got a few questions that are coming in here and I'll start with the first one here. First question is how to define milestones in commissioning contracts? Is it based on process readiness or priority process? And is it shut down and tie in in commissioning is set as milestone from commissioning? So this is from Divianga. That's a good, good question. Um, some of the milestones will be easier to define upfront in the project. Some of the design milestones or construction milestones, since they're a bit earlier. The commissioning plan may not be fully defined at the at the time of contract award, and some of those milestones may come at a later date. But when you're defining those uh, commissioning milestones, um, if it's a large project, you'll, you'll want to go through the process of systematization of your project, where it's broken down into, say, a few smaller chunks of the project that would form a system or subsystem of the project. Likely, uh, a milestone that would be defined is mechanical completion. So that would be the point in time when the construction team is complete, fully complete their installation along with all documentation. That commission, uh, that uh, mechanical completion milestone would be a good milestone to mark as a, as a payment milestone. Through commissioning, you could have an interim milestone where maybe portions of the, the pre-commissioning are complete and there's another milestone. Typically, that can get somewhat difficult because the pre-commissioning and the commissioning can largely blend into each other. That from your systematization, if you define that one subsystem as, uh, as one piece of the project, when it's complete, that could be a milestone as well. So that um, when that portion is fully complete, signed off and handed over to the owner, that milestone would trigger a, a payment, payment milestone while the commissioning team then goes and moves on to the next section of the project to further commissioning. Uh, several of those milestones could be structured and tied to payment milestones, um, even in advance uh, when the contract is being awarded. Uh, that can likely be determined to that level. To get to any more detail of, say, the steps of uh, each part of commissioning is, is pretty tough when the contract is signed. That could come at a later date, but by that time then, it's pretty tough to define those to payment milestones given that the contract's already been signed. So I hope that answers your question. Question from Awaludin. What happens with the contract if during the construction phase there are some changes in equipment design or need to build additional facilities? So this can always be the case. Despite everybody's best attention, uh, intention, the upfront design and structure of the project, 
things likely need to change, especially on a multi-year project. If your project spans five years, guaranteed things are going to change over that five-year time frame. Um, we would hope that there's not major changes where significant designs need to be reincorporated, but invariably there's always going to be lots of changes. If there's a, a large change in equipment, then that could be an entirely new contract that needs to be awarded as part of the as part of the project. If it's within the same contract and say what would be a, a good example is let's say there's a, a lineup of 10 transformers, small dry type transformers on the project, and it's determined that an 11th one is needed. That 11th one wasn't in the contractor's original scope of the contract and they haven't costed that into their proposal and, and cost structure. So there would need to be a, a change notice issued to request that the contractor price uh, supply and installation of one additional dry type transformer. Through that process, maybe it's a project change notice that's issued to the contractor. Well, they'll review the scope of work. They'll uh, price it, determine if there's any schedule impacts and reply back to the owner with those two uh, numbers or the response to, to the PCN. The owner can then evaluate that and if they're comfortable with the price, if they're comfortable with any impacts to the schedule, they can then determine to award that additional scope to the contractor and make a formal contract change to incorporate that work into the project. If the price comes back uh, uh, exorbitant, maybe too much, the owner doesn't want to incur the delays that that 11th trans transformer will impact on the project, the owner can still evaluate that and choose not to award that extra work and perhaps award it to a group after the project is complete to add that 11th transformer. So it's always a bit of an, an evaluation if there's new work that needs to be incorporated into the project. The owner and the contractor evaluate that through a formal change management process before deciding if they want to formally incorporate that new scope into the existing contract, into the existing project. <clears throat> so if you have any more questions, <clears throat> please, please submit them. Maybe I'll uh, explain a little bit <clears throat> more about some of the, the upfront procurement strategies where if the, if the upfront procurement strategy isn't done correctly, it can really cause lots of problems throughout the length of the project. If the, the upfront procurement strategy is strictly based on price, then that doesn't necessarily mean you're hiring the right people to form the project team. Uh, if, uh, if the contractor can't in fact do the work, isn't qualified to do the work, it doesn't matter that they were the lowest price. They're going to charge... Uh, as items come up, extra extra to the work delays in the project that ends up costing the owner more than uh, the savings that they think they would have gotten from achieving the lowest price. Um, you definitely want to consider all aspects of the project related to everybody's competency to complete the work. I'll also point out on large projects where there's a con contractor and a consultant involved you certainly want to ensure that the groups that are involved, it's the right um, contract structure with regards to the relationship of how the groups can work together. There's usually a, an engineer of record or an engineer role defined in a lot of the contractors, in a lot of the contracts. You definitely want to ensure that the right people are at the table to ensure that they're filling their role on the project. If the contractor, of course, has a role to build the project. There's usually an engineering role in the case of design, bid, build, where that design is coming from another group. And everybody needs to come to the table to fulfill their portion or their role as defined within the contract. It's not strictly just a, a one-sided relationship where you, you get somebody to go do their portion of the work. They're relying on others in potentially other contracts to complete their role. And it does need to be thought about upfront and how this is all structured to ensure that the right information is flowing at the right times to the right groups so that the work can be completed on time. 
question uh, from Alakan is what is the difference between SAT and SIT? So a SAT is a site acceptance test and a SIT is a site integration test. So in the case of SAT, um, a site acceptance test is very similar to a factory acceptance test. Whatever was built and assembled was likely tested in the factory with a list of tests to confirm that it meets contract requirements before it even leaves the factory. Now a portion or maybe even all of these same tests are completed again once the equipment arrives on site as part of the site acceptance test. So what, what this is confirming is that um, after the equipment has left the factory, there could potentially be shipping damage, there could be damage during installation, or it could just be not installed correctly. The SAT will confirm that the results that are measured on site align with what was measured in the factory to confirm that nothing's out of line, nothing got damaged, and that it is in fact installed correctly. The vendor may be involved in both of these. They would certainly be involved in the FAT. They may also come to site and perform the same or a portion of tests in the, the site acceptance test to confirm and sign off that yes, their equipment has arrived at site, it is installed correctly, it is functioning per contract. They get sign off, they get paid, they've completed their scope of work for supply of that particular piece of equipment. That piece of equipment can then be um, signed off and used in further testing on site once it's integrated with other portions of the project. So then this is where SIT uh, comes into play is the site integration test is that one piece of equipment plus all other pieces of equipment um, from a hardware perspective, as well as all the, the software, the PLC logic, the programming, everything is programmed together and then the site integration testing is completed. So this is not just the vendor's piece of equipment, but this is also the PLC cubicle rack and communication between the two devices, confirmation that from the HMI screen, you can control that particular piece of equipment and get the status back from that particular piece of equipment. And everything is working now as an integrated system. So very good question. And hopefully that answers what is the difference between a SAT and a SIT. I can add that the SIT would be still some of the, the pre-commissioning testing that's completed. Following that would be more of the, the integrated system level testing or process testing. The, the SIT may be confirmation of, of loop checks, confirmation that equipment can communicate back and forth from the HMI. But then following the SIT, once that's complete, is really where you'll get into some of your process testing. So that would potentially be inter, uh, introduction of chemicals to the system, introduction of wastewater, in the case of a wastewater treatment plant, actually starting up the, the plant process and uh, executing the intended function of the project. So if you have any more questions, please submit them and I'd be happy to answer them either in this live webinar or afterwards. You can add them to the chat here in any of the, the live streams or send us an email at support at commissioning and startup and we'll provide you any additional information that you're looking for. So if you'd like to access the certificate of participation for this webinar, this is an, is an example of what the certificate of participation will look like. And you can access that certificate at commissioningandstartup.com slash webinar dash cert dash today's date. So 10 December, 2020. Webinar dash cert dash 10 DEC 2020. Write that down and please go check out that link there and you can access the webinar certificate. There's a, a short survey to take as well and uh, also a copy of the slides if you're interested you can sign up at that link and access 
all of those items. I hope you found this presentation helpful and be sure to sign up for the next presentation. We'll be holding our next presentation in early 2021, date to be determined, but if you sign up, I'll be sure to let you know when that next live webinar is. Thanks for joining and have a great day.